This channel is not intended for children. Please kickstart responsibly. Hey everybody, I'm back and it's been a jam-packed April. So all of the March episodes have a ton of April stuff. It's still March now. There's still going to be more in there. And uh, that part's cool. It hopefully means that you'll have something that uh, you've been looking for or will want to play later on in the year. If uh, you want to jump ahead, feel free to do that. It's all in the description of the timeline, but let's get started. Now, I typically won't put games that are just about 2020 on the list just because they're usually scams or just nobody wants to hear about it. But this is an expansion for a game that already exists, so I'm going to put that out there. Great Eminence is about being a puppet master of world events. It's three to five players long. I'm going to guess it's a little bit like an Illuminati game. And if you're already playing it, then this is an expansion that allows you to utilize some of the things that have happened in this year, such as pandemics and uh, other world events that would make the game more enjoyable because it's a thing that could happen. It makes the game more realistic for you. And it's just an expansion. It's not the whole thing. It's not like somebody... The first thing that happened last March, somebody just recut a bunch of laser cut pandemic but uh, the the J I think I forgot the guy's name Laycock that guy uh, the one for Z-Man games they just recut a bunch of stuff for him and called it another game it's not like that it's it's a whole thing and it goes with uh, the Great Eminence game so if you're interested in that kind of content you got a couple other friends to play with I'll throw this in there and you can check it out over the next couple of days it's going to end soon Matt Laycock that was his name and he's coming out with a new game soon it's in prototype stages so. This is a new game. It fits in a mint tin. It's 11 bucks, and it is basically a memory game. So if you like that kind of thing, great. It's got some extra rules that allows you to score it in uh, certain ways, depending on what you pick up and uh, how you find uh, the different memory pieces. Uh, it says it's two to four players, but I think you could mod it to do a solo mode if you had to, because it is just a memory game. Uh, it might mess with the uh, way that the scoring is set up but you could still just play the memory part of it solo if you had to uh, based on a certain number of turns so if you want to do that you get 10 minutes this is the ideal type of game for your lunch break because it fits in a small size doesn't take up much table space and you play it in a very short amount of time so if you're interested in that kind of thing match them up might be for you then we have a game that is named in a way that's a little bit confusing it's called dirge the rust wars and uh, most of the equipment seems to be biological as opposed to old machinery. Um, it does have a gear, but that might make you think of steampunk, which is more of a brass thing than an iron thing. Um, so it's, it's a little, little tricky in how it, it's marketing itself. It has funded. The artwork is pretty cool. Like I said, though, it does look a little weird when you try to just look at the, the title or if somebody were to tell you the title and say, hey, look at this game, you might get a different vision in your in your head. It's a card game, um, and you're going to play in about 30 minutes, two players only, and you're going to do everything you can to defeat each other using these various uh, anachronistic technologies or biological technologies. There's like dragon-looking creatures and sky ships and all kinds of weirdness. It looks like the type of thing that... Um, if you could imagine the time before Dune was written and all of the crazy stuff you would find in a sci-fi magazine uh, when people would read physical magazines to get their uh, sci-fi doses instead of wherever people get it now, I have no idea, uh, short story collections or websites, that kind of thing. And you would see this neat little um, concept art that would go along with it from some far-flung space from Weird Tales or one of the other places on the cover. And it, it's that kind of feel but in a more modern context. Then we have one of, uh, I think there's a couple of these packaged uh, Kickstarters that go together. This one is for three games, Factory Funner, Bear Raid, and Ghosts of Christmas. Ghosts of Christmas is a newer version of a game called Time Palatrix. So if you have been looking for that game and haven't been able to find it, then they've changed the name. So uh, tell somebody, <laughs> I guess, what it is that they've been looking for. Um, Factory Funner uh, looks pretty neat. Uh, I don't know how to really describe it. The artwork is very busy, but in a good way. Uh, it's like a almost a kid's coloring book kind of way. And uh, it has that, that feel like they're creating all this wacky concoctions from going from one colored 
uh, like LHC looking device to some other big machine with a gear on it that changes it to another color and uh, that fits the concept of it being part of a uh, created factory the parts look pretty neat um, and I'm probably not the only one that has that opinion because this thing has funded itself incredibly well so that part has been pretty cool uh, if you're interested in any of these games take a look like I said um, you got the one that's this hard to find game maybe that's why people have been uh, jumping on it I don't know how they found out about it but uh, you know hope tell more people so they find out and they can get it themselves and we have another crazy successful game about flowers this one's about flower picking floriferous feels a lot like uh, prosperity the game from last week or the week before uh, it would fit that same person it's a relaxing game it's um, based on actual flowers, it has photography, or at least artwork that looks like photography, it's so close, that um, it, it feels like you're walking into a flower shop. It's got a couple of birds and other pollinators and different things. There are ponds, but they're not the regular ponds that you might pick up in a Game Crafter box. Uh, not one of the generic ones, they've been sculpted, they got a nice pastel look to it. So. There's a lot of high quality work that's been put into this game, as you can see from a visual level. Uh, one to four players, so if you did want to relax on your own with your own cup of tea, then you could do so in about 20 minutes. It uh, is a bit larger than the mint tins. It comes in a box instead of those, so I don't know if it's something that you would take necessarily to work, but definitely something that you could have on a Saturday morning if you're just sitting there um, relaxing and uh, letting the week go away before you start doing some yard work or something, then uh, this might be something very meditative that you can pick up. Then if you want a different type of solo affair, this is a solitaire game, Malta Besieged, and it is about uh, fighting World War II in North Africa between 1940 and 1942. So definitely different than arranging flowers. Um, it's got a neat looking map, and it uh, runs most of the game off cards. So uh, if you have the table space, I think this is not something you're going to take to work, but um, if you are already playing more games and you're interested in these types of uh, various theaters, there's so many types of other games and other battles that you can pick uh, and choose from. They've also been packaged together, so if you wanted Magnificent Style, Soviet Dawn, uh, or both, then you could get that as well, and those are uh, other World War II theaters and solo games that you could pick up. Uh, and also keep up the fire has can be added if you didn't pick that one up before so lots of different options for war gamers old school war games has um, created all these different ones uh, we've covered them in the past I'm hoping they've delivered <laughs> it's hard to tell uh, and, and just even thinking about the northern part of Africa I hope that ship in the Suez Canal clears because that's something I forgot to talk about earlier and it may be affecting the delivery dates on a lot of this kind of stuff, especially if you live in Europe. Then we have Questeros, and this is not the only tarot game, I think, uh, but basically that's what this is. It is a tarot deck for $25, and it has some one to six player elements that can be thrown in with it, or you can use it as an RPG deck if you wanted to do that as well. Um, you can utilize it, it says, as a deck of many things. I don't know if it has all the components of a deck of many things on there. I doubt they can do that uh, without paying uh, Hasbro. <laughs> so that's a, an interesting question to throw at them. Uh, I think it's some fairly simple Major Arcana type of things to go along with it. Um, there is like a pad that somehow gives you more information. Anyone can do a... Um, a tarot reading on their own if they wanted to it's just a matter of your interpretation of the cards how you lay them out and all that kind of stuff so uh, the fact that there's so many different variants will tell you that it's bullshit but <laughs> that's just how it works um, th there's also a uh, Jesse from Quackalope card so if you're a big fan of his and uh, I don't uh, I think it's like number 10 or 12 of the number uh, of websites you guys are like really into board game co and uh, that's fine, um, which is a friend of his. So, you know, maybe you want the duck to go along with it. Uh, you can get that from this card game as well. Um, you know, it's tarot. 
uh, it's hard to sit there and tell you much more than that, but basically it's tarot. If you're into it, then you'll check it out. If you want something more like an 8-bit dungeon crawl, that's what Crawl Out is. This is a solo dungeon crawl game told with cards and D6s. It has a uh, art style that's an 8-bit style. Um, kind of reminds me of playing the old Dungeons & Dragons games on 5 and a quarter floppy disks. Yeah, I started early. So, <laughs> they, um, they're in color though, so it's not like it's all the full black and white and all that, but... Uh, I would put the graphics of this up there with uh, the Kryn games that I used to play. Champions of Kryn? Yeah, it was a while. I played it on a, a 386, maybe? 11 megahertz, possibly? Yeah, something earlier. I know I had a, an 80, a Tandy 8086. Anyway, I sold it to some space company. It's probably in a space shuttle now. But uh, you can run around as, you know, the typical fantasy heroes. You got bards and druids uh, to go along with your fighters and wizards. And you fight gnolls and other things that are probably in the SRD for Dungeons and & Dragons. And, um, yeah, if you are not playing Munchkin Dungeon, if you need something else that you can play solo, then this is a fairly low-cost entry into a solo dungeon, uh, dungeon dive game. And then we have the return of Flick Fleet, Sit, talking about a return on your cost. Flick Fleet is one of the simplest ideas possible. It is these 3D printed ships and discs that uh, you flick a D6 and that sets your scoring. So there's a little bit of manual dexterity involved and um, I like that part of it. <laughs> If you are, maybe you don't have hands, okay, so that could be a reason why you wouldn't want to play it. But for anyone else, uh, I, I don't think it should be too complicated unless you have something where your hands don't work very well. Um, that you could really uh, practice hard and get the dice to do whatever you want, get them to aim in different places, give you a different kind of rush. Um, I like the idea of it, but it is two players. I haven't had anyone to play with. So uh, I haven't picked up the other ones, but I'm always intrigued whenever they pop up uh, of how this game would play. And if I could play with somebody that is old enough to where they're not going to chew on the pieces and learn, be able to learn the rules, I think they would be able to have a good time with it and maybe even be able to incorporate this type of ship-to-ship uh, -ship battle in other games, space, or water, wherever it could go. Maybe even with... Uh, some land-based stuff. Seems interesting. Then we have another dexterity game. This is called The Heads Will Roll, and it uses metal skulls, little tiny metal skulls that you flick as well. Here's the thing. Um, orientation is a big bit of it, so it's a bit like, you know, when you see the people rolling the bones in the, I don't know, let's say Robin Hood, when she's reading the chicken entrails or whatever. That's what it kind of feels like, because the, the orientation matters. If they're both on their side, if they're both up or down, then uh, you can get extra bonus points, flicks, and different things. Um, so uh, you're firing a dragon skull at a treasure chest. It's a little weird, but it is very manageable, as long as you don't lose the pieces. Um, they are metal. I don't know what type of metal they're necessarily going to use, but I'd say, you know, just make sure no one's chucking at anything glass, and I think you'll be fine. If you got one of those houses that has a lot of your board games painted, and they're all sitting in those glass IKEA things, then uh, maybe don't play this if you have kids <laughs> that are going to grow up and chuck these at them. Um, that kind of thing. I, I'd just say, you know, think about it before you go pick it up of who you're going to have around you and who you're going to play with and what you have to destroy. I say that every time about metal dice as well. All the same type of, of caveats exist. And you can use these as metal dice as well. Um, their orientation could be a d6. You can make it work for you. I am running late on all of these so far. <laughs> Fjords! Vikings! This is a uh, game that has been out of print for a while and they're bringing it back. It has some nice accolades. You can check it out if you want to. Two to four players, so there is no solo mode for it. But you can get the $25 regular box, or you can get some upgraded pieces for $45. And it's going to be available in a bunch of EU places as well. 
So that part is all great for lots of different people. Grail Games has had 19 other Kickstarters, so uh, I wouldn't worry too much about this one. It is a hex-based game of uh, pillaging and being a Viking. Lots of people enjoy that concept and that type of game, and uh, there's a reason why it's been sold out. There's a reason why there's been demand to have it back. And if you have been thinking about it, then this is your chance to pick it up. If you've never heard of it, maybe you should ch check out the uh, Board, Game Geek, Board Game Geek forums just to see how people have been reacting to it and uh, figure out if it's the type of thing that you would like to play as well. Um, I don't think there's a lot of bloody violence in this necessarily, so it uh, depends on your... Maybe you would prefer something like Blood Rage if you want something that's more violent. And we're back on time. And this time we have coins, metal coins. This is the sixth season of legendary metal coins from uh, these folks over at Draw Lab. And I mean, it's been maybe two years, I think, a year, maybe two years uh, since we've seen the coins and things that they produce. They're all high quality. They're all nice minted, stamped, all that kind of cool stuff. Um, yeah, if you need something special for your RPG group, if you want to do replacement uh, items on particular uh, board games that you've got, it's nice sometimes even to just replace a standee with a, a token, and a nice metal coin makes for a great token. You can use these also for, say, Magic the Gathering. Um, there's 50 different designs. This is the sixth season, so if you're looking for anything in particular you might want to look at what the old stuff that they've got as well and uh, just shoot them a message and see where um the availability is at for for them um dwarves atlantis norse gods uh different planets it doesn't really matter what your style is that you're looking for you'll probably find something in here if you think that it would be a good fit for you they're not all even round some of them have cutouts and hollows, which you don't see on normal coins, which makes it less like a piece of currency and something more like an art piece with uh, adventure weapons included in that concept. So give it a look and see if it'll help you be more immersed in your gaming. And then we have also more expansion packs. This is for DVG. These are uh, Dan Versen Games. He's got a bunch of different theaters. Uh, this time the uh, expansions are going to be for World War II, Gulf War, and uh, the modern era in the 2020s, um, he specializes in having card-based military uh, war games. I don't want to necessarily call them military simulations, it's hard to tell. Uh, I haven't played the games to know, I haven't been in the military to know how accurate they are as far as battles, but uh, he does a lot to get accurate artwork, usually photographs of the different pieces, and um, you can pick and choose from a lot of different decks uh, different types of uh, armaments, be they cavalry, mounted, or armored, or something from the airplanes, or troops, or there's been dozens to hundreds of different packs available, and uh, there's quite a few available in this series as well. So if you've been playing, um, over 300 people are also joining in. It is well, well, well past its um, pledge numbers, so it's been a popular method of uh, getting these types of packs out to people who are enjoying them obviously to have them keep coming out so often this is the 25th campaign created by them if you're into it I give them a, at least a quick look and they have the uh, crate box now so you can store your stuff and then we have another one of those combo packs this is Solani and the girl that uh what is it it's the the girl that who made the stars these are creation myths turned into um I don't want to say tile or mosaic laying. They're, they have different shapes than that, but they have um, these. They look like tiles. They look little uh, round token pieces of various colors, and uh, the colors kind of line up in a way that makes you think that it's a mosaic, but it's not like a soul or one of those other types of games. It's just um, it, the, that's what the pieces end up looking like. It is evocative so much of um, different existing mythologies uh african and asian mythologies about how the world was created there are some uh, interesting looking meeples they do not look like meeples at all uh in that style they have their own art style to them uh, which is something that you could use to upgrade other games if you wanted to as well 
Um, take a quick look. Uh, some of it text-based, some of it is just weird types of puzzles that uh, exist and go along to uh, also be part of constellations and uh, other things you could teach your kids about as you go through it. It's, uh, it's an interesting setup with very good artwork that fits a style that is very approachable. Then we have Immunio, which is uh, the idea of crashing a bacterial birthday party. Um, you have different types of cards that will stop them having a good time, different types of immune system builders, such as antibiotics, and then you have different bacteria. They're not necessarily like uh, electron, uh, they're cartoony, they're not like electron microscope looking pieces or any type of microscope thing. There is one that looks a little bit like Corona, then there's ones that look like little squid people and uh, other things that you might have invented off of that, uh, I think it's Will Wright created, the Spore game, when you start as a single cell and you work your way up. Um, it's probably as complicated as Go Fish. It's uh, definitely made to be accessible to kids. So I think if your kids know their numbers, you could probably pay the, play the game and talk to them about what bacteria are and why you got to wash your hands and that kind of stuff. It might be a, a good way without specifically calling out COVID um, to you know make a fun way to present these ideas to your kids. Then we work our way to Napoleon. This is 1815, Scum of the Earth, the wa Battle of Waterloo card game. So it's another card-based uh, war game. I don't know how similar it would be to the DVG stuff, probably not by much. Uh, the art card artwork looks great. Uh, it's all based on actual tactics and events that happened during this battle. So if you are a historical person, um, you know, there's probably a little bit of license given to it, but uh, I don't think you'll easily find a um, card game that fits this kind of war theme that has as much invested in the artwork as you'd find here. Uh, there's different uh, different types of wound and health tokens um, that you could utilize in other games if you didn't like them <laughs> for other ones. They look like little drops of blood or drops of tears. Uh, and uh, it does still have the uh, different square cardboard pieces uh, that you see in a lot of other of these type of war games, even though the uh, game is mostly told and uh, play through the cards uh, so that might still feel a little bit like you're playing one of the regular war games that part's up to you uh, i'd say at least take a look if you have been turned off by war gaming before uh, because of the simplicity of the artwork then maybe take a look at what they've got here because it is very eye-catching and then you have quad city killers this is back uh, i'm guessing it didn't quite make it before I remember having a really high uh, amount of money that it was it needed in order to be created. It's come down to maybe 10% of that, and uh, it's almost funded. So if you were interested before and you missed out on that opportunity, well, here it comes around again. You can check it out. They have tried to make some improvements. That's why this one is set at a 2.0, and it's got a lot of different things to go along with it. I don't know how many times you can play as a serial killer. Um, it is a game, but it also has some components that look like an escape room. Um, I think it is more of a game than an escape room. And I would rather play Brook City. I have that game, um, that is cop themed. I also played, I got it behind me, the Unsolved Case Files, which is an escape room using uh, theoretical, um, like it's a murder mystery type thing. And I had a lot of fun playing that. Uh, this kind of fits in between those two spaces. And if you have neither of those, then I think you might have a good time here. I have both of those, so it's not necessarily for me. Uh, Quad City, I think, is around Grand Rapids, where they're from. Um, but uh, otherwise, I don't know where that is and that might be a bad title doesn't people won't know it's a real place easier to understand along those lines is connect the bay this is about the san francisco bay area you are in charge of creating the t or any other type of transit line that you want oh it's bart there sorry they call it the bart um and uh simplified 
MTA style, a Metro Transit Authority style maps. Um, not a lot uh, to complicate things other than the topography itself. And you can set things up however you can in order to create the best system possible. Um, one of the weird things, ants. If you model ant behavior, you end up finding uh, like the most um, efficient routes to places. <laughs> And a lot of these MTA type people have been using those models to create the best systems. I wonder if this follows in that same footstep or if it just ends up becoming the map that already exists. And if you would have any, uh, any advantage by knowing those routes. But check it out and see if maybe they'll in the future have some other types of challenges for other cities that you can play that would be more familiar to you if you're not in, uh, in there. Uh, in the San Francisco area. If you just want to dip a toe in it, you can also get a print your own copy for a very low cost as well. But if you got murder on the mind and you want it to be more fantasy based, then maybe you would prefer Foul Play. This is a brand new Once Upon a Crime story. And um, yeah, if you're looking for princes and princesses and court intrigue and all that kind of crazy stuff, then you can pick that up. Uh, you can also get the Manor House Murder, the original game for Foul Play to go along with it. For It is $8.95 in British pounds, so that's like $11 or $12, I think, in American, and whatever it is in EU terms right now. Um, not a lot of money. If you do want to just play something that is uh, fun with another person, 30 minutes, two to five players. If you did have somebody to play with at lunch, uh, or kids could play this at lunch, and I know there's a lot of like gambling games, Magic the Gathering considered as one of them, Pogs was considered as one of them when we were kids, then uh, maybe this is something that uh, your kids could play now and not have too big a deal and uh, you know, be over with pretty quickly. Ages eight and up, I don't think it's that big a deal unless you're really against murder for eight-year-olds. But if your kids are a little older, maybe you want to bring them into a different fantasy world. This is Medieval Encounters. It is a dueling card game, but uh, also includes strategy RPG elements. And uh, I think the artwork looks really cool. Um, it is, it's not anime, but it has some of the type of feel that goes along with it. It's um, like a more detailed version. Uh, I can't pronounce the guy. Gendi, Tartatartatartatar. The guy that does uh, Samurai Jack, uh, they have a little bit of the same type of um, uh, proportions, uh, hard angles and things like that associated with it, but it has a little bit more detail to go with it. Uh, and if you're into card games, this has 80 different action cards. You can take it with you in a uh, little wallet that they provide that if you wanted to, comes with uh, like a faux snakeskin uh, look to it. It's a pretty slick looking uh, card carrier, and uh, you might be able to use it for something else to go along with it. Um, but yeah, I've I've got some snakeskin leather sitting around here somewhere. This stuff's not cheap, even when it's uh, stamped like that. Um, but so that makes it just a really cool thing to have along, even if you just use it as a card carrier later in life. Uh, I think it's a it's a neat little um, package, a neat little uh, concept that will be useful for more than just carrying the game. But maybe you want something a little more modern. Contraband Insider might be for you. You play the role of a corrupt police officer. Uh, this is not a common um, protagonist angle that uh, is told from uh, or is used for the storytelling portion of a lot of games. Um, again, cop related, Brook City. I'd rather have my time spent playing that, considering how I haven't had any time to play it in forever and I spent all the time painting it. So. I wouldn't go for it necessarily, but I think that there is a good portion of people that would like to play a cop game. Um, and then after you've played a bunch of those, maybe you'd want to play a dirty cop game. And maybe that might make you enjoy the cop games that you play a lot more by being able to play on both sides of it. So I think that's an interesting concept. It is almost like an RPG in the way that you have to think about how you move the goods back and forth. And if that would encourage you to play some more non-fantasy driven D&D uh, things, D&D uh, like games, and do something that's 
more smuggler related and a different, um, I don't know, like Firefly or Star Wars or something, uh, even more modern takes. Uh, I think this might be a gateway to those ideas. Uses a lot of photography and puts things into the modern age with their contraband uh, smuggling. So that's a different uh, venue as well since there's so many that are already on bootlegging. So I think it's interesting. It's a niche that hasn't been filled by a lot of uh, or oversaturated by a lot of other games. So it might be something scratching the itch for somebody, especially if you like Hong Kong thrillers Jet Li used to make. Then we have a trading card game. This is Kurbond that it looks like it's uh, about spellcasting or, or maybe it's a Pokemon game. I, it's, I've been having a hard time trying to figure out exactly what uh, is going on about it. The coolest thing about it, though, that I would like to know more about is there you can see in the upper right hand corner they have uh, a dial system that tells you a lot of information uh, it's a multi-part um, health counter type of uh, system that uh, you can quickly look at lots of different things going on on the table at the time and the rest of it is told out in hexes as you move across uh, I'm sure what is a treacherous fantasy land um, with interesting monsters and whatnot. Uh, the monsters you can also pick up. Um, they look really cool in that metallic effect that the, they've been given, but these are going to be done in epoxy resins, so they might be a little on the brittle side. Lots of cool things going on, but I have no idea how to play the game. And for this next campaign, that won't matter. This is printed game components. Now, it may make you think that you're printing it out on paper. No, these are screen printed. These are wooden pieces that are used to upgrade games that you currently have. So if you want to make replacements for standees, meeples, cardboard, whatever the thing is, or you have some regular um, just single color meeples that you would like to replace with something that is a little more character to it, these are painted versions. They come in all different time periods and styles. You can take a quick look at what they've got going on. Um, there's a lot. I don't know how they're gonna, how many they're gonna produce of each one. I'm sure they have to run a screen of a certain number. Uh, and there's a lot of competing other groups that wouldn't necessarily, um, that would would already take the replacements for these. But I think you should give it a look if you're playing a lot of games that have not the greatest uh, components, or you picked up a lot of print and play type of games then maybe this will help you uh, make them last a little longer or uh, play them a little bit more because they feel and look a little bit better. Uh, or maybe you're trying to save some money in the future and you want to get some print and play games. You might be able to use these generic components to help you continue to go because they do not cost that much. But take a quick look, see if you're interested, and uh, maybe it'll help you enjoy yourself a lot more. And then we have... A campaign that is very small. One dollar has been pledged by one backer, and they need ten thousand to get it off the ground. This is Trias, a simplified Yahtzee. Um, they do not explain the game at all, at all. They roll it a little bit and they ask you for money. But this is about the least amount of effort you can put in and still get this onto Kickstarter, and that's why it's at a dollar. Um, if you've been looking to create your own system if you've been on your own campaign or you've had a hard time or anything like that, I think this is uh, something you should look at as far as campaigns go about it's this is what it gets you a dollar. This amount of effort put in thinking about the person that is coming to your page that's what I'm talking about. You got to always think about, win the money from the person who came to your page and you got to do it within 10 or 15 seconds otherwise they're going to be off and looking at something else that is far more engaging and somebody who's put in a lot more work so um, uh, good luck to them in the future maybe they just put this out there to see how it would do just for the giggles sometimes it helps to look at the bad ones as well as the good ones this is one that has done a pretty good job of explaining who and what they are. This is uh, Battle for Biternia. Biternia being an 8-bit system. You can tell from the standees that they put out there and the 8-bit maps. It feels like you're playing an old Dragon Warrior game. 
um, or an old final, one of the original Final Fantasy games uh, in that respect. So uh, you're doing the basic fantasy run through, not quite a dungeon, but running across the land and uh, battling monsters. You can be uh, fighting the slayers, the spider queens, bone mages, werewolves, demons, and vampires. That part is all really neat. Um, I don't like 8-bit style art on printed uh, components, but that's just a personal preference. A lot of people do enjoy it. So if you're into that kind of thing, then uh, you can get this uh, expansion for uh, the Pixelvania Hero Pack, as well as the base game if you have yet to pick this up and decide that you want to. It does have a neat looking box also to go along with it, I will tell them that much. Um, if you had this on the shelf uh, and it was jumping out at you, it would definitely makes you want to sit there and pick that game up and uh, see what's going along inside of it. If you're bad at spelling and it's not from dyslexia, it's just because you don't get enough practice, Espelingo aims to make you better at it. And the idea here is you're going to be traveling around the board and you can pick different challenge levels and that will give you a word to spell. If you spell it correctly, then you can proceed forward. If you don't, then you can't proceed forward. So, um, yeah, I think if you're an amateur spelling bee person or not quite into that uh, world, but you want to try to get your kids better, maybe this will work for them. Additionally, you get a bunch of different types of cards, and uh, they're set for different age levels, so junior, adult, etc. So, uh, yeah, I don't think any of these are too difficult to spell, but you probably haven't thought that much about the spelling of things now that autocorrect exists. So uh, it could be an important and fun game uh, for everybody, really. Then we have Grapple Maniacs, which is essentially an arena game in a wrestling ring. Um, you get also all of these interesting... Uh, they look like the muscle characters uh, when they're laid out like this. You can paint them if you wanted to. Um, and the designs are not final, but it feels like the toys we had in the 80s. And you get to fight back and forth using various cards with special moves on them. Uh, the card artwork looks, uh, you know, like it would have fit in an updated version of, what was it, like the Hulk Hogan cartoon um, that we used to have, the Hulkamaniacs or Hulkamania cartoon. It would fit well into that. It would also fit well into, like, that Street Fighter uh, art aesthetic uh, that goes along with it. There are some luchadors, there are female wrestlers, there's some guy that looks like Sting, or maybe that's a girl, I don't know. Uh, depends on how you look at the art. Uh, there's even an alien. There are uh, different uh, uh, genders, colors, all that kind of fun stuff of people. And uh, who knows, maybe there'll be even more things that you can pick up later. There's different uh, new challenges and death matches and all kinds of crazy stuff that they've included in the game. So if you're into this and you haven't picked up one of the other wrestling games that's out there, maybe give this one a shot because it also comes with your own little wrestler mini. Then we have a storytelling game about hypotheticals. This is I Would Kill Hitler the Party Game. And it's got a lot of stuff going on. There is a plot uh, that you have to construct based on a hypothetical and you have to tell a story to go along with it using various rules that you pull up and plot cards so uh, you have a gallon of gasoline could be one of five such as uh, you must also say horny jail I mean there's uh, Sinclair Fartfuck is your name that's what the cards say uh, you can create lots of different stories but you could also go nowhere real fast. Uh, you're supposed to be able to do it within 60 seconds. If people can read that fast and generate something that fast, great. But it, it, these are long turns that everybody has to pay attention to. And in, in a phone culture world, that might be difficult to pull off. Uh, but if you do have a group of people that are going to come up with fun and exciting ways uh, to tell these stories, film them. Make a YouTube channel. We'd all love to see how that turns out. Then we have a game that looks really cool on the left and it throws you off on the right of the screen because the artwork of this uh, kaiju destroying a city looks amazing. And then when you look at it in a 3D printed concept or in a 3D printed reality of that concept, it doesn't quite have any the required amount of detail that you would need to tell the story of the game. 
However, it's still an interesting game. It's like Rampage, uh, the video game we used to play where you got points for destroying stuff. This is a two-player game where you get to basically be a giant uh, kaiju, blob, robot, or whatever, and do the same thing. I think if you were to replace the components of this with some other toy or some other thing in scale, you would have a much better time. Uh, I'm not sure if they're going to keep the uh, components. The ask for this was very low, so I'm going to say that it's probably just some cards and uh, stuff that they 3D printed out themselves. That's okay. Uh, a lot of that stuff is neat, but um, I think that you will find, especially on the RPG episode, a lot better models to do the exact same thing. If you want to pick up this game, I think you'll have fun using it to play with your toys. It's just, uh, it just doesn't look as good as it should. Then we have Tornado Roulette, which is a party game that has drinking aspects that can be added into it with uh, Sober Up and uh, other drinking types of card uh, named stuff that you can get in there. Um, then there's challenges that you can do completely sober, such as dancing, twerking, shaking your butt, drawing something, or handing your phone unlocked to another person. Um, let's hope they don't send any naked pictures to your family members, let's say. Um, who knows what they're going to do for that 30 seconds, but the idea being you wouldn't like it. Um, yeah, maybe throw those cards out. <laughs> they're, uh, the, the dancing ones, the creative ones, the... The drawing and all that, that sounds like it would be fun. Being able to take them out or put in the different drinking cards, uh, depending on how the game works, is interesting. There are sh uh, life shots, so you can take and pour drinks into shot glasses and gain extra life uh, out of it. Um, the way I feel generally about drinking games is they're not fun for anyone over the age of 23. <laughs> Uh, at that point, uh, you've pretty much decided what you want to drink, and you don't want to waste it, or and you don't want to drink a bunch of tr cheap crap that you would waste on playing a game. So uh, if you can remove those elements and still have something fun, I think that's a better purchase. Then in a similar vein, we have Spillin' Beans, which it, it describes itself as a means of destroying relationships through playing a game. Um, it does look like it has some neat trivia. Uh, there are lists of things things that you um, you pull a card of and it says name a bunch of Harry Potter characters and you compete back and forth to be able to do that other games have played that as well um, the idea here is also supposed to say things about your current relationship status uh, and that there will be a sanitized grandpa approved version I think it might be more fun actually to go with the grandpa approved version the mechanics of the game look like they'd be interesting Still fulfilling the concept of a drinking game without the drinking required um, in order to play and have the game be fun. So uh, I would say uh, it has an okay explanation of how the game runs. Uh, I think you'd have to actually look down the page and get uh, some ideas of what um, the have the, as challenges on the actual cards themselves. Um, it doesn't have really anything to do with beans. Uh, those just happen to be characters that they created for use in the game. Um, they're icons that you can be. The rest of it is really just about player versus player imagination and um, recall. So if you're into those types of interesting competitive games, maybe this one's for you. Then we have Tome, which is a trick-taking game based around the concept of casting spells. So you have different elements, and um, they allow you to have different rules played in different... Um, it's basically exploding kittens with spells. Let's put it to you that way. So you can uh, mess with a bunch of people. You have uh, at least three folks. Um, up to four is ideal because you have different elements in the four elements, and there's ways that you can uh, uh, reduce that if you need to. Um, but yeah, if you like the concept of playing uh, exploding kittens, but you want to do it, with more of a fantasy flair, then uh, take a look at the rule book and play along, and you'll be able to do so here. And a different type of take that game with a different type of theme that might be more acceptable, honestly, is Turducken. And you are going to have to go out and hunt, uh, and other hunters will be hunting too, 
the components of a turducken. So you need to go get yourself a turkey, duck, and chicken. And uh, you have wacky uh, different uh, characters that you can be. They're all from different uh, types of icons. I don't recognize them necessarily as uh, anything from pop culture, but uh, there's the one guy that has one of the, the Aztec wooden and obsidian swords to hunt with. Then they have the uh, gentlemanly type from England equestrianism. Um, they've got all different, uh, maybe even super spies and folks from more urban environments. Like the guy can be Suge Knight right there in the, the center right. You don't know, but you do know you need a turkey, duck, and chicken. Something I am going to tell you about the turducken, and I have made two of them. Cajun Grocer uh, sent me one that already had the stuffing and everything inside, and that was the way to go. Yeah, it was 100 bucks, but that was definitely the way to go. Just threw it in the oven. It was fine. The uh, first time I got a turducken, I went and got it from like uh, Bristol Farms or one of those places, and my aunt, my terrible aunt, um, decided to throw it in the oven before I got there and just burned it to hell. It was terrible. Second time, Cajun Grocer didn't let share it with anybody, made it at home. It was good. And we're back with the tarot stuff. And this is a Bad Baby Unicorn tarot deck. So if you wanted to get yourself involved in the art styles of tarot cards and reading, but it didn't have enough unicorns for you, and they weren't in a um, style that would elicit the concept of terrorizing be or being terrorized by baby unicorns then this is your time your time is now break out the rainbow glitter here you are and that's about all i can say for you and if you want uh to make a board game out of it you can play sephiroth which is a one to two player game with three different modes of play that is also a tarot based card game so maybe you could take your baby unicorn tarot, you can take any of the other tarot cards that have already been part of this episode, and you can incorporate them into this board game. So um, it's done really well, especially for a first-time creator. It's well over $100,000, and uh, I don't know why. I don't know why this one particularly is uh, so popular over... The other ones that have been offered, the art style is very Art Nouveau, and I think that looks pretty cool. You'd find it um, very similar to what Alphonse Mucha uh, came out with in the Czech Republic or Czechoslovakia at the time in the late 1800s, early 1900s, around that time frame. They look nice, but I mean, tarot cards come in so many different shapes and sizes, and they've been around for so long. I've got a drawer full of a bunch of them, like I've got a Salvador Dali one and a bunch of other ones too, but I wouldn't necessarily um, go the distance for any of them. Um, they, you can get it in a nice wooden box if you uh, buy the deluxe version of it, and otherwise, like it's always been a game, so check it out. Maybe the type of art style will win you over. And then we have a game that I can't remember if we covered already. It was been out there for a while. I don't know if I just missed it. It's called Sling Strike, and it is table hockey, but you play with rubber bands instead of an air hockey table, and that makes it super portable. Um, I mean, yeah, you're going to have as much uh, of the little pucks flying off the table as you would with anything else. You'll block and do all the other crazy stuff uh, as best you can. You might have some fingers that get snapped by uh, pucks flying from the other side, but uh, that's just part of the risk, right? What's hockey without a few fights? So it has not done well, which is making me wonder why, or maybe that, that it slipped under the radar too far, and I haven't been able to, to catch it until now. But you know, I did not want you guys to miss out on the opportunity here. Maybe if you didn't want to pay for this, if you did have one of those wooden hockey tables uh man you know those toys that came out with like air hockey pool and you'd see them in the park every once in a while they like flip over I, i've seen them come down in price and a lot of folks have them for their kids if you want something like that you can play them play this type of game with them then uh you know or you can strap a rubber band to one of those other games that part's up to you and if that doesn't do it for you, maybe Arma Will, which is another very similar flicking style game. Just doesn't have the rubber bands, but there are posts if you wanted to put one in between them. 
And the idea here is you're going to be flicking it a, a disc around this track, doing the best you can uh, to, I don't know, maybe not hit the insides uh, where it will bounce you in a weird direction so that you can continue to move forward and race around another puck. That would be my best guess on how it's played from what you see there. Um, yeah, it's expensive because it's all handmade by someone who knows what they're doing with wood tools, but uh, that makes it a very nice piece to have on your table, out in the garage, or you know, out in the patio area, and you can play a fun, interesting game, and even have something for guests with kids if you don't have any of your own to be able to play without having to break out too many extra components. And if you did lose something, it's not the end of the world. It's pretty easy to replace some dowels. Then we have another drinking game, and this one's called White People. Um, it's just a game where you can uh, make people more jerks than they already are. Uh, I do like the sense of humor that's involved, such as if you've already complained the game was offensive, then you have to take five sips of your drink. Um, the number of people or the people uh, in, the, in the group point to the person who would most likely ask to speak to somebody's manager. I already have a picture in my head of the most likely offender in the group, and I guarantee you it's someone's wife. Um, you can probably guess who it is. You don't even need to know me, and you already have a picture in your head of who that is. And that's what's going to make the game fun. Um, yeah, I mean, yes, it does have a racial name, but you know what? Who cares? And that's kind of the point. Just have fun with it. I've seen the demographics. You're probably uh, playing games with somebody who would fit into this uh, into this kind of world. And if you're playing the games and you're buying the games, hopefully you're the one that also has the sense of humor about the games. And uh, if nothing else, you'll laugh if you play it with them. But if you're like me, and you don't have anyone to play with, then maybe a solo roll-and-write RPG game, a print-and-play version, is something that you might enjoy. Why isn't this one on the RPG episode? Because I had room on this one, and not on that one. But maybe you'll want to check it out. There's a lot of folks that like the journaling games, they like the solo stuff, and they like low cost. And that's what this Rad Zone game is all about. You're out there in the apocalypse, you're trying to lead some survivors, into um, some type of societal saving uh, uh, world, something where you have enough supplies to keep going because you'll have constant needs and you have to venture in different bad places in order to get them. And uh, yeah, so you know the post-apocalypse. You've probably played Fallout or at least seen it. Um, you can probably throw uh, zombies into it if you wanted to. But there's various journey charts that go along with it, different locations, search areas, uh, characters that you can meet up with, and decisions that you have to make. And uh, it'll be a cheap way for you to enjoy it. It's, uh, I think, five pounds is the best way to get it on the digital side uh, for the cost. But you can get physical ones that cost a little bit more to go along that if you want to pay more. So enjoy it out there in the UK. And that's it for me. As you can tell, I have been yapping for it's way too long, and i got to close up the episode. Uh, if you missed the... I tried to bring up about the Suez Canal thing in the middle of the episode. If you were skipping around and you missed out on it, you're probably going to have some stuff being late. Uh, there is no way to know. There's over 200 vessels that are already backing up in the canal, and it's going to increase every day until that thing gets uh, pulled out. I don't know if they're pulling the containers off of it and they're going to tow it out but basically i think every um tugboat in the area is trying to collectively bring all their horsepower together and yank that thing out i don't know how they screwed that up but it just goes to show if something even so insignificant as someone uh driving incorrectly goes wrong in this world then we can have some giant problems to go along with it and unfortunately, that canal is a great way to get goods from China to e the EU. Um, so uh, there might be some games of yours that are delayed. Uh, there might be some resources and things that go to factories that might get delayed. 
and it's just something we're gonna have to keep an eye on along with all of the other problems oh man there have been so many with shipping so um, yeah don't expect too much out of shipping I think I said that when I did my beginning of the year uh, video and ever since then um, yeah it's just it's gonna be one thing after another while we try to get our feet back under us or you know uh, I don't know, start swimming. I don't know how it would be analogy you want to use for boats and uh, or simile, whichever one you want to use. Uh, we'll go from there. With that in mind, I hope you have a good one. And I'm going to make the RPG episode tomorrow because I'm dead tired. And um, hopefully that won't be too long uh, of something. If you did want to play a game along with me, there is the Kingdom Death episode that I made for the subscriber um, landmark. Some folks have asked for more kingdom death uh type of stuff you can put that in the comments if you agree with them and if you want to see me play more games i can try to find a way to do that the only reason i haven't is i just don't have the time because these episodes take like 25 to 30 hours a week to prep because there's been so many campaigns these days um so i just don't have that much extra time uh working a regular uh work week so um to devote to more gaming and painting and trying to stay sane but if you guys want to see more of it you can ask for it and i'll try to come up with something you guys have a good one